Okay, eight o'clock. Let's go. Page fifty-two. Page fifty-two. Okay, um, last Friday, yeah, last Friday, we went through the signs and stages of anesthesia. And so let me just backtrack again, repeat, as I always like to do in the beginning. So don't write anything down, we'll just go over what we went last week. And I mentioned that the signs and stages were a system set up by Dr. Goodell back in the 1930s, I believe to describe what is anesthesia to learners. He was teaching a bunch of residents how to put someone to sleep and using open drop ether, which I'm going to show you a movie about here in about two minutes. And <clears throat> so he had a way to describe it and he came up with what he called the signs and stages. Stages being <coughs> four, uh, stage one, the analgesia, stage two, the excitement stage. Stage three is surgical anesthesia, where you want to get to, and stage four was overdose. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Um, and then he looked at various signs that you could look at uh, back in the 1930s, you know, your eye signs, muscle tone, blood pressure, heart rate, respirations, uh, reflexes and described what happened to him as the patient got deeper and deeper. So we went through the different signs, the reflexes, and all the uh, things that go along with it. So uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to show you uh, my buddy Mark Gabbard, who I students here know, one of our faculty members from one of the Kaiser hospitals. So. He found these movies, he gave them to me kindly. And uh, so anyways, let's take a look. I think you'll enjoy it. This is from 19, I forgot one. Let's look. This is kind of scary. Let's see. 1938. Let's see. 1944, yeah. The simplest method of inducing anesthesia is by dropping ether onto a mask through which the patient inhales the vapor. Although better results can be obtained by more elaborate methods, ether is relatively safe, and as comparatively few accessories are necessary, it's valuable as a standby when other equipment is lacking. <laughs> it's one of the difficult anesthetics to get really well. No blood pressure. First, we'll show you how it should be done. <laughs> this is going to make us look really good. <laughs> Here is the apparatus you need. A medicine bottle for the ether, which is fitted with a Bellamy Gardner proper. Kind of if you have a medicine bottle and dropper, an ordinary stock bottle will do, and you can improvise a dropper on the court. <laughs> Cut two grooves, one on each side of it. Put a gauze wick in one groove. and ran the cork in firmly. This will give you a steady flow. The mask is a Schimmelbusch or other standard design. It has a spring band to hold the gauze in position. The gauze has been folded into 10 or 12 thicknesses. It's kept into position over the mask.
you'll also need a piece of Ganji, 8 inches by 10, with a 4 inch slit in the center. A piece of oiled silk or jackanet with a small hole in the middle. It's high tech here. <laughs> You'll want a tube with sterile Vaseline to lubricate the airways. This is a water's metal airway which is curved to fit the pharynx. It will be tolerated at a lighter depth of anesthesia than will the older type of rubber airway. The nasal airway is an endotracheal tube cut to about 5 inches. This is transfixed by a safety bin to prevent it disappearing down the nose. <laughs> it also is carefully lubricated before use. Other accessories include a gag, a swap holder, a bowl of gold spots <coughs> and a bottle containing liquid paraffin or castor oil to drop in the patient's eyes after the operation. Now we'll skip this. I'm going to skip around a little bit. Uh, now for the patient. The most important points in preparation for an anesthetic are rest of obstruction, also see that there is a clear airway through at least one nostril. Place the Ganji over the patient's face. Tell her it's to protect her face from the anesthetic. It also concentrates the ether vapor by ensuring that all the inhaled air comes through the mask. Make sure that her eyes are closed, or the Ganji might come in contact with them and lead to conjunctivitis if nothing worse. <laughs> then place the mask in position. How'd you like to be that patient? I think it's a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the needle on the mask. Place 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 the needle the mask. Place the needle on the mask. Place the needle on and then lower it gradually again. <laughs> Provided the breathing is regular, the rate of flow should be progressively increased until you're pouring it on. But don't soak the mask. The chief guide during the induction of anesthesia is the breathing. With loss of consciousness, it alters, becoming irregular, deeper, and often noisy. It will usually take 10 minutes to reach the second stage of anesthesia. 10 minutes, can you imagine? Don't look at the eyes, or you may disturb the patient if she's not quite off. <laughs> but this is what they would look like. I'll do it anyway. The pupils are <laughs> very usually small, and the eyes roving from side to side with a divergent squint. Nystagmus, right?
And I can imagine that it's got to be going all over her face. It's just a wet rag, you know? Yeah. Plus his face is right there, but even the Under this, carbon dioxide will accumulate. Our breathing will deepen, and the anesthetic will be taken in more rapidly. The jaw is not relaxed, and you can't put in an oral airway yet. If the breathing is not free, put the nasal tube down one nostril. As you saw, this is transfixed by a safety pin to prevent it disappearing down the nose. <laughs> Beat up the flow of ether as fast as you will take it. Watch the breathing all the time. <laughs> After another five minutes or so, there's a fairly sudden change to regular, so-called automatic breathing, which shows that she's down to the third stage of surgical anesthesia. You'll find the eyes fixed and central with small pupils. The jaw is now relaxed and the patient will tolerate an oral airway if you consider it necessary. As the jaw relaxes, the tongue falls back against the posterior pharyngeal wall and may obstruct the breathing. The artificial airway holds it forward and the proper support of the jaw will keep the breathing quite free. This is how you should hold the head, with the chin up and the jaw held forward by pressure behind the angles. You can keep your finger on the pulse in the facial artery where it crosses the lower jaw or in the superficial temporal artery in the angle between the upper border of the zygoma and the ear. The patient is now ready for operation, but we'll continue and show what happens as anesthesia is deepening. Put her into stage four. Oh, let's skip to the little further along. I get the this patient's airway doesn't seem satisfactory, and the anesthetist can hear bubbling sounds. He lifts the mask and finds him. Oh, I can roll anything. Or any spasm. Too great a concentration of ether vapor produces laryngeal spasm. If the warning sound of stridor is ignored, the glottis will close completely and breathing will stop. It's a waste of time to continue pouring on the ether that the patient is taking none in. Keep the mask right away and wait for the spasm to pass off. Write <laughs> <laughs> it out. <laughs> Can you imagine what the saturation is right now? At least they don't have pulses. <laughs> time, watch it out. It's got to be 30. Fortunately, breathing usually returns before the heart is finished. Fortunately. You've got to get the air into some somehow. By mouth to mouth interpretation, if there's no other way. They don't have ambu bags, so. Wow. When the stridor is gone, you can continue cautiously with the ether. <laughs> There's the four. This patient is very deeply anesthetized, and the breathing is shallow and jerky. The pupils are widely dilated and do not react to light. This is the fourth stage of anesthesia. If the anesthetic is continued, she will soon stop breathing altogether. This is not a grave complication with ether, unless she becomes silent. <laughs> <laughs> Stop breathing at all, you know, it's not good. Out is strong and steady, and the heart will continue to beat until the effects of anoxemia are felt. 
<laughs> if she does become diagnosed, you must perform artificial respiration. There's artificial respiration. <laughs> He pokes his finger right in her eye. You mustn't try the corneal reflex, or you may produce conjunctivitis, or even corneal ulceration. It's not in any case a reliable site of anesthesia. It's not in any case a light or moderate anesthesia, but it definitely means nothing. Here yeah, the patient is in light anesthesia, as shown by the eye movement, yet the corneal reflex is absent. Can you imagine it gets At the end of the operation, put a drop or two of liquid paraffin or castor oil into each eye. But don't do it before the anesthetic, because the ether vapor will dissolve in the oil, and this again may cause conjunctivitis. <laughs> Let me show you one of All the difficulties you've seen can be avoided. That's good enough. <laughs> Anyways, you can watch them there on the website. Uh, but you get the point. It was pretty crude. And that's what the signing pages were designed to describe was open drop ether. Despite what some of my colleagues says, I'm not old enough to have a kid. <laughs> I tell you, I'm a wrestler around those days. It wasn't. Um, but uh, certainly, and as I mentioned last time, uh, nowadays, it's all this kind of thing. We get narcotics to provide analgesia as much as we want, as fast as we want. The patient goes to sleep in one arm to brain circulation time with propofol. And uh, uh, we still use gases, and the same thing happens, but it's a lot faster, and that's what we're going to talk about today uh, the kinetics. Uh, so it's the same idea, but we use different drugs and get there in a different manner. Um, but uh, uh, the human body is going to react the same way in, as you see. That's kind of what we talked about the last time. And so uh, today what I want to do is to start in, talking about real anesthesia, 2017 style. And uh, so uh, to do that, let's turn to page uh, 61. Page 61. Now the, way I, uh, the best way I think to learn anesthesia or the anesthetics is let's first concentrate for the next several classes on the pharmacokinetics of the anesthetics. How do you get them in and out of somebody? That's what we're going to talk about. The absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, pharmacokinetics of the gases. Then, in the next week, or week after, we'll do the pharmacodynamics. What do the anesthetic do to the person once it gets in there? We'll talk about the physiological changes, cardiac, respiratory, renal, etc. But first, let's concentrate just on getting them in and out of somebody, because that's important, uh, at least the initial important uh, factor. Now, uh, on page 61, I list the uh, current gas anesthetics. And uh, when I was in school, They were teaching anesthesia. We had halothane. On the bottom there, I put halothane historical. I'm going to mention just a little bit about it um, because it does have some important history. We're never, I'm not going to ask any questions about halothane. You'll never give it. Although I say that, and some of the students who go on missions to other countries, South America, to Asia, and so on, uh, actually were surprised that halothane is still used in those countries because it's so cheap and easy to give. Uh, but nonetheless, when I was in school, we were looking, halothane was the drug. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try to be a good student. So I went to the drugstore and bought a notebook, and I made a line down the middle. I wrote halothane on one side, fluothane on the other. 
frequency flu thing is a trade name. I thought it was two different drugs. Jerry what I knew when I went to school. <laughs> so I started taking notes and I'm going, boy, they sound awful, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, duh, can you be any dumber? Uh, so uh, I said to myself, well, when I started teaching anesthesia, I said, you know, I'm not going to take anything for granted. I'll start by just let's talk about the names of the drugs. <laughs> so at least you can all start in the same place. So let's go through the names. Sevofluorine is certainly the most widely used anesthetic gas. Currently, in the U.S., uh, the trade name is Zoltane. Everybody refers to it as Sevo. Isofluorine is the uh, kind of the old dog nowadays, and uh, its uh, trade name is Fluorine. Nitrous oxide is certainly way old because it's back from the 1800s. That's nitrous oxide. Uh, Desfluorine is another inhalation anesthetic. It's referred to as Suprain. And then alphane is, of course, uh, historical. We don't use it in the United States anymore for reasons we'll talk about. So those are the names of the anesthetics that we're going to start to talk about for the next several weeks. Okay. Now, in order to go through the kinetics in, in, in slang, in coffee room talk about anesthesia people, everybody refers to this as uptake and distribution. So what are you studying? Uptake and distribution. In other words, taking the anesthetics up and distributing them around the body. But the re you know, formally, really, it is the kinetics. Uh, and uh, there's a gentleman, a uh, physician, anesthesiologist, Dr. Ted Ager, who's uh, uh, anesthesiologist emeritus now, uh, University of San Francisco. And he came up with a strategy to teach this and to learn this that I think has been used since I was in school. That's, you know, forever ago. And everybody, anesthesiologists and CRNAs, have used his little uh, teaching method to learn and, and conceive of how the anesthetics go in and out of somebody. Uh, so we're going to use it too. I think he did a great job. And if you look on the next page, you'll see that he breaks down, that's page 62, he breaks down the anesthetics. He said, look, let's look at it this way. You got to start with the machine. Next, they go to the lungs. Next, they're in the blood. The blood carries them around the body. And then finally, they go off into the tissues. In our case, we all, it's the brain we're, we're carrying, we're worrying about, right? Then, of course, at the end, it comes the way backwards. These are see arrows both ways. So that's kind of the way we're going to look at it. If you go to the previous page 61, there's a little fancier drawing. This is from my chapter. And there's a machine showing it going through the breathing circuit into the lungs, then the blood, arterial venous circulates around, picks it up, carries it off to the brain, and they go to sleep. So there's machine factors, the lung factors, blood factors, tissue factors. And that's the way that he kind of breaks everything into, and that's the way I, I, I like the way he does it, and, and we're going to do that uh, that way as well. So, uh, <clears throat> before we start, now one last thing, and that is uh, going with my idea that a lot, some people have not been in an operating room yet to any great extent, maybe just to a shadow, you kind of didn't know what was going on, or you semi knew what was going on, but not as much as you do now. So, uh, I made this little film with uh, a buddy of mine, Jeremy Heiner, for those remote sites. <laughs> uh, Jeremy's an uh, airway expert. He writes the chapter on airway in my book. And um, uh, him and I did this film. It's uh, oh, a little more than five minutes long. And it's just so I can give you, I know that you might not have a concept of what I want to talk about or what I am talking about. So you'll see, it's self-explanatory. So let's watch this film. So I'll show it to you in a few minutes. All right, so what, am I, what are we going to talk about? Um, we got to take an anesthetic. You go to work in the morning. You go in the anesthesia department. You go in the workroom. They have a storage room with all our equipment. You get a bottle off the shelf. It's got an anesthetic in it. It's a liquid. It's in a brown bottle. So you go into your room. You walk up to the machine. You open up the vaporizer. You pour the liquid in. 
And there you go. You have to vaporize. You have to change it from a liquid to a gas. And then we deliver the gas. Was, that's what my little movie shows you. And again, when Clinton comes in, I'll have to fix it. Um, so, first of all, uh, we're going from the liquid in the bottle to the gas out coming out of the machine into the patient. Next, it's going to go through the lungs. There's going to be a lot of factors we have to think about. Third will be uh, in the blood, carries it out to the <coughs> tissue. Okay. Now, did you ever watch Tom Cruise do Mission Impossible movies or James Bond? You know, Dana Craig does James Bond. And they always have these scene where Somebody sneaks up behind somebody, has a bottle of liquid, pours it onto a rag, sneaks up behind them, puts it over their face. They struggle for about 10 seconds and then they fall on the floor in a big clump, unconscious, right? As if, if only we could do that. <laughs> uh, that's not the way the real world works. And uh, sevoflurane is, uh, other than nitrous, sevoflurane is the most rapid anesthetic we have. And breathing sevoflurane, straight concentration, it's going to take you oh, three or four or five minutes to go to sleep. So in that movie, you said you heard him say his open drop ether, it took him 10 minutes to go to, from through stage one into stage two. By the time he got to stage three, it took him 20, 25 minutes. Right? We got it down to about three to five. That's as fast as probably we're ever going to get. For reasons I'll explain. You already know this. Or you didn't know you knew that, but you, you know it. All right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a scenario. You go to work, critical care. You get to work in the morning. They assign you some patient. You get your, uh, your report. You walk over to the patient's bed side see that they're being ventilated, controlled ventilated, and uh, they got monitors and pulse acts and drips and, you know, your typical work day. So you look at the pulse ox, you check the patient out, and the, the pulse ox, I'm going to make this up, let's say it says 50%. <laughs> so you go, you make a nursing diagnosis. <laughs> Using the nursing theory, <laughs> and you go, hey, that's not right. <laughs> it should be higher. <laughs> so, anyways, kidding aside, let's say it's 50%. I'm trying to be dramatic here. So you go, well, something's not right. So let's pretend you listen to the chest, you look, check the tube out, there's nothing mechanical. All right, the tube's in the right place, the chest is fine. In, in, uh, Patients being ventilated. It's just low. So you decide that you're going to go up to the ventilator and you're going to put them on. You look at their FiO2 and it's 30%, I don't think so, 35%. And you say, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to bump them up to 100% while I'm trying to figure this stuff out. It's a rational thing. You've probably all been in that situation, right? So you take your hand, you put it up to 100%, the dial or the buttons or whatever the ventilator happens to be, you put it up to 100%, all right? You don't expect to look up from that ventilator to the pulse ox and see it go from 50% to 100%. Why don't you expect that? It takes time. Why does it take time? Because you're absolutely right. Number one, it's going to take a couple of minutes for that ventilator to start putting out instead of 35%, where it was on the dial, out to 100%. The extra oxygen's got to go through all the tubing inside and out through the breathing circuit and up to the, where the endotracheal tube is, blah, blah, blah. So you're going to take a minute or two for the 100% oxygen to start coming out of the machine. Number two, the patient's got to breathe some in. The chest has got to go up and down a few times, right? Probably three or four minutes worth of time. They're going to be, have to be ventilated. Let's say you've got them at a rate of, of 12 times per minute. So it's going to take three or four minutes for the chest to get that extra oxygen into it and for their PO2 to rise in the, 
in the lots. All right, make sense? Then, at the same time, all this is occurring at the same time, you're going to have to have the heart beating, pumping blood into the lungs, picking up that extra oxygen, and then carrying it off into the tissues. And in the case of this pulse ox, which is what we're talking about in the example, let's say it's on the patient's thumb, you got to be able to get the blood to circulate enough with that extra oxygen that you just started giving into the patient's thumb so the uh, reader, uh, what am I saying? I'm trying to think. The pulse ox uh, uh, thumb clip okay, can start reading the extra oxygen and they can start being reflected into the dial. So you turn the ventilator on 100% and then you wait, and maybe two minutes later it's 55 percent, pulse ox now 60, and it goes to 63, and it goes to 68, you get the point. And over the next three or four minutes, hopefully, if everything else is fine, you're going to see the pulse ox rise up to 100 percent. Right? So you inherently know it just takes time to take gas from a machine and get it to go into a patient's tissue. Just, just the way the human body set up. You got to get it out of the machine, you got to get into the lungs, increase the concentration in the lungs, and you've got to uh, get the blood to circulate through the lungs, enough time to pick up the extra oxygen, then carry it off and dump it off in the tissues. All right, the same is true of an anesthetic. When you turn an anesthetic gas on, you're doing the same thing. We got to get it to number one to come out of the machine, Number two, we've got to build up enough level of concentration of PaO2 in the lungs. Well, the PaO2 is uh, Pa of uh, SIVO uh, in the lungs has got to go up. In the meantime, enough heartbeats got to go by, the pumping blood through the lungs, picking it up, carrying the SIVO out into the tissues. In this case, the brain we're going to want to go to, and it's got to go off in the brain, get dumped, test the receptor, and put the patient to sleep. And that's all going to take time. And SIBO, the fastest drug we have, and I'm not sure we can get a heck of a lot faster than that, even with an ideal drug, then it's still going to take, like I said, about three or five minutes. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Just by knowing that it takes that long to kind of move a drug. Give me one second, I'm going to call for a minute. I'll see you. So you get the point. It's going to take a few minutes to put someone to sleep, and uh, so let's talk about it. So on page 62, the uh, first couple things that have to do with the machine, and I'm going to say these <laughs> very quickly, and then we'll move on, because I don't care about the machine. Right? Somebody else is going to teach you the machine that cares a lot more than I do. I'm going to care the fact that, yeah, the gas comes out of the machine. That's about as deep as I'll get. And we'll move on. All right? But first of all, it's going to depend on the leader flow that you put it on. And uh, when Clint shows up, I'll show you that on my little movie. But if you look on page 64, page 64, well, actually, I'll go on the camera and point. This is a, uh, well, let's look. This is a graph. We always start, when you look at a graph, what are you grafting? This is 
O2 administration in seconds. So you put oxygen on somebody, and this is how long it, for seconds, 60 seconds, 120 seconds, etc. And what are we measuring? Fraction change in oxygen in the lungs. So how much, how fast, when you put on oxygen mask, you've done this a million times. You go into a patient's room. They got a little oxygen meter in the green on the wall, right? So you take a plastic mask, it's got plastic tubing, you hook it into a little gauge, you turn the leader flow on, you put the plastic mask on, somebody, bingo. How long does it take for them to start getting oxygen? Let's look. Oh, this is half a percent. You say you put on seven liters or whatever. I'd say somewhere around here, they're almost to the top. So it's around 60 to 90 seconds, maybe, before they're getting it sufficiently through that mask into the face, right? Seems kind of fussy, but nonetheless, I want to point out that when you turn the machine on, it takes one or two minutes for the gas to go through all the tubing inside and start coming out and going to the patient. All right. Since we're talking about kinetics of anesthetics, then this is one factor. Now, if you turn on that little flow meter on the wall, the patient's room, to two liters, it'll come out to a certain speed. If you put it on 10 liters, it'll come out faster, all right? It's not rocket science. And so, for, for us, same thing, I'll show you in my little movie. Uh, if we turn that liter flow higher on our machine, we have dials to do that. Uh, we can get the gas to come out faster, but you know, you're kind of wasting uh, gas. What's your average tidal volume? Around 500 ml, half a liter, right? So, if I'm flowing 10 liters of gas out of my machine, and you're only breathing in a half a liter at a time, I'm wasting an awful lot of gas, right? So, it's an expensive thing. But anyways, this one shows the, the uh, uh, gas. Now, the next page, page 65, is the same thing. We'll, we'll change the dial a little bit, the liter flow. I know this is exciting. All right, this is fresh gas flow, three liters, six liters, 12 liters. All they're trying to show is the higher you turn the dial, the faster the concentration in the lungs goes up in minutes. All right, so we're applying fraction of the lungs over minutes. This is a three liter flow, six liter flow, 12 liter. So I would say, three liter flow, let's eyeball it. It takes about two minutes to reach what you're giving. With a 12 liter flow, it took about, what do you say, 30 seconds? That's a lot. You're sitting there waiting for someone to go to sleep. Two and a half minutes is a long time. Okay, Mr. Jones, take a deep breath. <laughs> So, I typed in capital letters on the bottom of the figure. The higher the gas flow via the anesthesia machine, the faster the anesthetic will reach the patient. Thus, the faster the patient will go to sleep. Now, as I mentioned on my little movie with Jeremy, uh, what a lot of people do is they start high, so it starts coming out fast. And then, uh, as the case starts, you know, five or ten minutes in, they start to put the flows down so they save money. So it's okay in the beginning to bump it up a little bit and then back down at the end. Okay? All right, secondly, if you look at Dr. Eggers' little four boxes, and I'm going to keep referring back to this page, 62, then you see the second thing he puts there is you have to consider absorption into the plastic and, and uh, other parts of the, the anesthesia machine. Now, if you want to turn to page 66 at the top, some poor schmuck 
had to do this for his research project, probably for his doctorate degree. His mom was proud. <laughs> so what he did is he studied how much anesthetic soaks into the plastic tubing in the machine and doesn't go to the patient. How much soaks into, well, he did rubber bag, the breathing bag, we squeeze. Some of it goes in there. Anesthetics are very, very lipid soluble. And how much soaks into the endotracheal tube? Plastic. All right? This is very exciting. <laughs> and you'll see for all different anesthetics, they came up with a different coefficient of how much soaked in where and this and then. Nobody cares. All right? <laughs> Here's what I want you to know. The anesthetics soak into various parts inside the machine. There's gaskets, there's rubber washers, there's all kinds of stuff inside the machine that it's made of, and they can all absorb some molecules of the anesthetic. The plastic, the rubber parts, the anesthetic, uh, endotracheal tube, the bag, the whatever. Now, theoretically, Dr. Agger says if it's going into the machine parts, it's not going into the patient, and that would slow things down. But it's so academic and, and minimal that I don't think it really in the real world makes a difference. What it does make a difference, and you're going to learn this, and it's very important, I'm not going to bother with it, but in a patient who has malignant hyperperoxia, which is a disorder triggered, number one, by the gas anesthetics, where they get hyperperoxia and the print temperature goes up and up and up until they die, the number one trigger for producing an attack are the gas anesthetics, except for nitrous oxide. So, if you're going to give a anesthesia to a patient with MH. There's a whole protocol. The MH Society publishes the protocol. We all follow it. You got to take the machine. You got to take all the vaporizers off of it because there might be a little bit of a leak or a weak gasket or a, a worn out piece of rubber. And even though you don't have the, the vaporizer turned on, it might still be just you know molecular leak in it. You got to flush it with 100% oxygen for 30 minutes just pure oxygen to make sure you get every molecule out of the inside. There's a whole protocol. Because even just some molecules, you didn't even turn the gas on, but you just the fact that you use an anesthesia machine that's been used before with gas in it, might have some molecules in there that would be enough to trigger an attack. You'll learn all about MH from somebody, and it'll be all exciting. All right, so under a machine, Dr. Ager's Two parts here. He says, number one, the leader flow matters. Number two, absorption. I went to page 62. Number two, absorption into the plastic parts in the machine matters. So those are the two machine factors that he discusses. So I discussed them. And now I'll never discuss them again because I kind of, you know, so what? And, uh, and we'll move on. So now that we'll just pretend we got the anesthetic coming out of the machine and it's going to the patient in the first place, of course, with this inhalation delivery. So the first place it goes in the lungs. So we need to talk about the lung factors. So let's take a break and we'll do it when we get back. Okay, we're back to page 62. Page 62. Now, I mentioned this in the last class, but I'll repeat. And we're talking about putting gas into the lungs. <coughs> Normal room air is 79% oxygen. Let me start again. 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. And again, they're a little bit fudged because it's really 20.8 something oxygen and so on. This is water vapor, you know, there's humidity, and there's a CO2. Now, when we give our gases to the lungs, it's a closed system, so we can pick whatever we want to give. And as I mentioned the last time, um, even though there's 21% oxygen in room air, which sustains us quite well, under anesthesia, you've got to give at least 30%. So right off the bat, we give 30% oxygen. We can control the other 70%, whatever combination of gases we want to give. You can only give 100% of something, right? All right. Secondly, 
each gas in the lungs will behave like it's the only one there. All right, there's a gas law, Dalton's law of partial pressures, and it states that gases behave independently, even though they're in a mixture, I'm paraphrasing. And uh, that's true of the anesthetics, they don't really influence each other, they're all behaving like themselves. There's one little exception to that, I'll tell you about that next week. But for the most part, it's true. So we can look at each gas individually and see how it behaves in the lungs. Now, we went to page 66 the last time and looked at the figure on the bottom, figure, I mean the, uh, the table on the bottom of page 66, and said uh, we talk about the dose of anesthetic as the MAC. MAC being the minimal alveolar concentration required to produce surgical anesthesia in 50% of the population upon surgical stimulation. So will the patient lay still when the surgeon cuts is what it means. And that's the dose it takes. We look at it as lung concentration. Why? Because we can measure that. We measure it in our machines. We have readouts. Inspiratory and expiratory. How much is going in and how much is coming out every breath. So I know what the lung concentration is. Really, what we want to worry about is the brain concentration, right? I want to know how much is in the brain, but I can't figure that out minute, you know, breath by breath. Can't ask a patient to give me a brain tissue sample and send it to the laboratory and see how much SIBO's in there or whatever. That's silly, obviously, right? But we can measure how much is in the lungs and infer from there how much is in the brain. And I'll show you some very graphic reasons why the concentration of the lungs is almost identical to the concentration in the brain of an anesthetic at all times. The reason being the anesthetics is so lipid soluble, the blood brain, bar blood -brain barrier does not uh, represent a barrier at all to the diffusion of the anesthetics from the blood into the uh, brain and there's some other factors as well. So I'll, and I'll show you this graphically that the concentration of the lungs is almost at all times almost identical to the concentration in the brain. So we, we refer to MAC, the alveolar concentration, we're really caring about the brain concentration, but we don't have to worry about it. Because they're always pretty much the same. See what I'm saying? So on page 66, I said the MAC of SIVO is 2%. That is 2% SIVO is in the lungs. 30% oxygen, that's 32%, and the other 68% can be whatever I pick. I can throw some nitrous in there, I can give room air, I can do whatever. All right. Now, I, you're going to have to get used to this, but it's too much math for us people that breathe gas all day to do. <laughs> but we'll say this, give the patient 50% oxygen, 50% nitrous, and 2% sepal. Right? So if you add them up, that's 102%, right? We know you can't do that. It's really, what we're saying is, give 49% oxygen, 49% nitrous, and 2% SIBO. But it's just too much math, all right? So we just round everything off. All right, I'll show you my movie now, finally. I know you're waiting with great anticipation. It's a little more than five minutes. In order to understand how you get an anesthetic from the liquid in a bottle, and to show you a little example, this is the way the anesthetics come, is a liquid in a brown bottle. And you have to get them, ultimately, the liquid changes into a gas, you do it with a vaporizer, then you have to deliver the gas out of the anesthesia machine through the patient's lungs. It's circulated throughout the body by the heart and cardiovascular <laughs> system. And then ultimately it gets to the patient's brain and puts them to sleep. Now since many of you have not had much of an opportunity to be in the operating room, I thought I'd spend just about five minutes showing you some of the apparatus that we use so those who haven't had any experience yet will have a mental picture of what I'm talking about. So I have my uh, colleague, Jeremy Heiner here, 
and he's going to <laughs> and touch all the buttons for me as I talk and, uh, and uh, let you know what's going on. <clears throat> so, you take the anesthetic and pour it into the uh, vapor and he can maybe show you that, uh, you know, they have a little uh, portion that you can, can actually fill the vaporizer with liquid and this is not the way, the right one, but nonetheless, it'll show you how you do it. The vaporizer is filled with liquid. And then we're going to start delivering some percent of anesthetic. And if you notice, he, there's a dial he's turning, and the dial is numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So you can pick what percent anesthetic you want to deliver. For example, say Jeremy wants to give 3% gas, he's going to turn it, as you can see, to 3%. So you control how much is being delivered to the patient. And we uh, call this the FI, just like when you ventilate a patient with a ventilator in ICU, you deliver a certain FiO2, but we deliver a certain FI of whatever gas we're giving, isofluorine, desfluorine, sevofluorine, etc. So you can say the FI of this gas is 3%. Then he also, before you even start that, he's going to have to turn on the oxygen and either a combination of nitrous oxide and air or maybe just oxygen if the patient is fairly critical and needs 100% oxygen and he can do that. If he wants to give a mixture of nitrous oxide and oxygen, he can do that. Nitrous oxide is being the blue gas. And then if he wants to do a mixture of air and oxygen, he can do that. The air is the uh, yellow dial. So these are just classic flow meters that you have, you're familiar with from working in uh, uh, critical care, as well as on the ward, you plug one in the wall and you hook somebody's nasal cannula to it. You've done that a million times as nurses. And you can see Jeremy can, has a choice of turning on a low flow of one or two liters per minute, or he can really turn it way up to maybe 10 or 12. I don't know, how has it done, but... <laughs> up to 15 meters per minute if you really want the gas to start coming out of the machine fast. Now the nice thing about putting on a high liter flow is that the gas gets out of the machine faster. The downside is of course it's more expensive and you're wasting a lot of gas. Remember somebody's tidal volume is only three to five hundred mLs per breath and if you're flowing all that gas you're wasting a lot of it, they're not breathing it in. So most anesthesia folks try to uh, eventually end up with a fairly low flow in order to economically save gas. Now, if you're going to give a nitrous oxide and oxygen, how do you determine what percent? As I'll discuss with you, the maximum percent of nitrous oxide that you can give somebody is 70%. But let's pretend. Let's say I want to give 50% nitrous and 50% oxygen. All right, there's no percent dial on the machine. But I know that I can do 50-50 and that Jeremy's already dialed it in because he's given the same number of liters of nitrous as he is of oxygen. So he's dialed in a flow of two liters of oxygen and two liters of nitrous oxide. Therefore, it's 50% nitrous and 50% oxygen. So if he wants to uh, check up a little bit to maybe 70%, he could, you know, the leader flow up a little bit and give a little bit more uh, uh, nitrous oxide and so on. So we don't have a dial that says percent for nitrous oxide. We do it by calculating the leader flows that we're giving of each drug. And as we'll discuss, you have to turn on the oxygen first, otherwise the machine will alarm. This way you're always giving oxygen. You don't mistakenly give somebody anesthetic without oxygen. In fact, if Jeremy turns all the dials off, and you watch what happens when he turns the nitrous oxide dial, the oxygen dial turns on automatically. So he won't even let him mistakenly turn on the nitrous without oxygen turning on. So you always have to give the patient oxygen. Now, once you've decided what to deliver, in this case we're, you know, maybe say 2% gas, 
in 50% nitrous and 50% oxygen. So that's what he's turning on there. So he's got 2% on the vaporizer, 50% nitrous, 50% oxygen. I know that because it's 2 liters and 2 liters. He can give 3 liters and 3 liters and still be 50-50. Or he can give, you know, all the way up to 8 liters of nitrous and 8 liters of oxygen. That's still 50% of each. But what's the sense of doing that? You're just wasting gas and costing money. So we try to, you'll see, most people get fairly low flows. You don't want to go too low because the machines aren't that accurate. But he's down to around one and a half to two of each. So it's 50 <coughs> All right, so now he's getting 50% oxygen, 50% nitrous, and 2% of the anesthetic gas. And it's going to travel through the anesthesia machine, and it's going to start coming out of the uh, breathing circuit. And you'll notice that our breathing circuits are what are called semi-circle systems. They have two hose, a expiratory and an inspiratory hose. So the gas comes in through one hose into the mask, and it exhales, the patient breathes out, it goes back out through the other hose, and it goes in a uh, unidirectional manner, in one direction because there's valves in here to keep it flowing only in one direction. It goes through the carbon dioxide absorber down on the bottom on the way out and that removes the carbon dioxide and then the gas is sent back into the inspiratory part. You just rebreathe it again and it's a matter of economy. This way you're not exhaling gas and inhaling gas you can reuse the gas you've exhaled, just bring it back in again. You just can't rebreathe the carbon dioxide as your CO2 would go up. So Jeremy, as you can see, can squeeze the bag uh, as many times as he needs to and get a fit on the patient's face and deliver as much uh, respirations as he wants. The faster he squeezes the bag, the faster the patient goes to sleep. The higher he turns the dial, in other words, the more drug he gives, the higher he turns the dial on the machine, the faster he goes to sleep. So if he puts it on 6%, the patient goes to sleep faster than if he had it on 3%. That's called the concentration effect. The higher concentration, the faster he goes to sleep. The ventilation effect is the faster he squeezes the bag, the faster he goes to sleep. So these are some of the conditions that we're going to talk about. But I just thought I would take a minute to make you a little bit familiar with the way the machine works. You're going to learn this from, in detail from other instructors. But this way, when I mention some of these things, as we start going through the different parameters, you'll have a feel for uh, what exactly I'm talking about. Uh, so that's the end. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. OK, so back to the lungs. Uh, we control, as we showed you in there, how, what gases are in the lungs and um, what patients will we want to deliver to the patient and uh, um, through the lungs. So, the uh, dose of the anesthetic is the MAC. And if you look on page 67, 67, there are factors that make the MAC go up or down. And, for example, factors that re reduce the MAC. It, Mac, remember, every time you hear that word, what are you saying in your brain? Dose. Things that make it, you have to give less. In a set. Well, oldies, geriatrics, hypothermia. If you give sedative hypnotics along with it, IV, you're going to have to give less anesthetic. Giving other anesthetics, like nitrous along with it. Some of these other drugs as well. Factors that make you need a higher Mac. Somebody that's young and healthy and, you know, muscular, etc. Uh, hyperthermia, hyperthyroid, blah, blah, blah. In fact, there's a lot of any fact, and we're going to go through a lot of these as we go along. What's that? Redheads. I'll show you some figures. Yes. <laughs> Takes more to higher dose to put redheads to sleep. Go figure. Uh, redhead males, too, yes. <laughs> scary, isn't it? Okay, so let's start going through Dr. Uh, Ager's uh, 
for the parameters here. Oh. Okay, again, page 62. The first thing he talks about under lungs, number one, is called ventilation. This one is simple. And I want to show you, we're going to uh, show you ventilation here. And by to do that, I've got to stop for a second and go on that tangent. And we're going to camera point. We're going to go to page 68. Okay. Now, when, I, when we draw this out, we talk about uh, insects going into the lungs and out of the lungs. We always use one figure. You're going to see it over and over again. And I'm going to say it over and over again. And that figure is this. We plot the amount in the lungs over time. We do that, this is time in minutes on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, how much, well, we talk about how much is in the lungs, we use a fraction. The fraction is called the F sub A, you can see it there, divided by the F sub I. All right, the F sub A means the fraction in the alveoli. How much gas is in your lungs? F sub A. The F sub I, traction inspired, is how much you turn the dial. You control it, F sub I. The F I, it's like the F I O2 on a ventilator. The F I of SIBO, the F I of DES, the F I of whatever. We make a ratio out of it. So let's pretend you're Jeremy's case and he, he uh, cracked the SIBO vaporizer to 2%. So it's a ratio. So right now, the patient hasn't breathed anything yet. He turns the vapor to rise to 2%. So you got nothing in the lungs over 2%. FI, I'm sorry, FA divided by FI. First breath, let's say you get oh, just uh, 0.1%. Second breath, 0.2%. You know, and so on and so forth. The FI, and the FA starts going up, the amount of the lung starts going up to try to approach the F-A-I. Let me say it again. <laughs> the F-A starts to rise as it approaches the F-I. In other words, this is what happens. You look at the curve. If you're plotting the amount in the alveoli, F-A, divided by the amount you turn the dial on, every time the patient takes a breath, one is going to, F-A is going to start getting closer to the F-I. I put it on 4%, if it's nitrous, and I put it on 50%, then how fast does it go up to 50% in the lungs? And that's called the FA over FI. That is the rate of rise of the anesthetic gas in the alveoli. How fast the anesthetic rises in the lungs is referred to graphically by us as the FA over the FI. Does that make sense? Now, we say, what the anesthetic books will say is, you approach equilibrium. In other words, this is a scale from 0 to 1. When this number is 1 up here, that means the FA and the FI are the same, right? So let's say I put 2% on. So the FI is 2%. When the amount in the lungs, the alveoli is 2%. 2 over 2 divided by, by 2 is equal to 1, and I'd be right here at 1, right? We call it equilibrium. And the amount of the alveoli is equal to the amount you're dialing in, you've reached equilibrium. Or, you've reached the top of this curve, right here. This is when it flattens out. See what I'm saying? You never reach equilibrium, ever. Well, actually, somebody did a study one time, Caliphate, and they said it would take around three point something days to reach equilibrium. The reason you don't reach equilibrium is because there's always insensible loss of the gas. It's bubbling out of all the holes in your body, it's going through your skin, you're always losing some, so you never quite reach the amount that you dialed in. You get close, you approach equilibrium. 
you never quite reach it because of insensible laws. Okay, so what am I plotting here? What I'm plotting is how fast these anesthetics rise into the alveoli. Right? Like sulfide, des, sebo, iso. How fast do they go up in the lungs? That's the FI, FA over FI. All right? Everybody with me? Go to the next page. The second box from Dr. Egger is ventilation. The number one factor he puts in next to ventilation, that's what I have on page 62, he calls it ventilation. All right? This is ventilation. The faster you breathe, the faster you go to sleep. It's as simple as that. Watch. We're plotting the FA over the FI, which is the rise in the alveoli, versus how many minutes of the anesthesia has gone on, and what he's doing. This is the ventilation. So let's say this is isoflurane. This is normal ventilation, this line here. And if you doubled it, the dash line, the alveolar concentration rises more quickly. Does everybody see that? This is dash line, solid line. This is how fast it goes up under normal conditions. Let's say I turn in 9% des on the vaporizer, and I start ventilating, and it'll go into the lungs this fast, the rate of rise in the lungs. Let's say I double ventilation, Breathe twice as fast, squeeze the bag twice as fast, and it'll go in faster. All right, everybody see that? This is an old drug we don't use anymore, pentrine. This was normal. This is if you double ventilation. You get the point. The faster you breathe, the faster you go to sleep. I wrote, it, I wrote the answers for you down in the bottom, see what I got. <laughs> The faster you breathe, the faster you go to sleep. Let's read what Dr. Ager says. The FA over the FI ratio rises more rapidly if ventilation is increased. In this case, double. Solubility modifies the impact. The effect of the anesthetizing partial pressure is greatest when the drugs are more soluble. We'll talk about that later. Nonetheless, when you breathe faster, you go to sleep faster. In anesthesia lingo, we call it bagging the patient down. If the patient's light and we want him to go to sleep faster, we squeeze the bag, bag faster. But if somebody goes, hey, well, bag them down. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> that's the way we talk, you know, among ourselves, right? So that's the ventilation effect. Now, the next thing I'll show you on page 70, the second thing in Dr. Ager's little boxes, number two, it's called concentration. That's why I mentioned in my little movie. This one's real easy. The higher you turn the dial, the higher the dose, the faster it works. That's true of any drug, right? If you're going to give a drug 100 milligrams of some injection, and if you give 200 milligrams of the injection, it'll work faster. 300 milligrams, it'll work faster. That's true of any drug. So this, these are no different, even though we're giving them by inhalation. So, this is Ventilation is all the same, controlled. This is the FA over the FI, rising the alveoli over time. This is 0.3% gas, 1.5%, 4%, 6%. What do you see? The, fact, the higher the concentration, the faster the rate, lung concentration rises. The more you give, the faster they go to sleep. It's true of any drug. It's just kind of basic pharmacology. So, one of the ways we get patients, because we can't get them to sleep any faster than three or five minutes with the fastest drug, what we do is we breathe them faster, bag them more. That's one way to cheat a little bit. Pump the concentration higher than we need it to. Give them a little kind of loading dose idea. I mentioned that last Friday. So we increase the concentration. If I'm the Macasivo is 2%, I may put it up to 6%, 5%. Bag them for three or four minutes and then back down to 2%. Just trying to push some in more quickly. Make sense? Okay.
Back to page 62. So, um, next to lungs, Dr. Ager's model, number one was ventilation. We know that. The faster you breathe, the faster you go to sleep. I'm on page 62. Number two is concentration. The more you give, the faster you go to sleep. All right. And number three, he's got, it's called the blood gas solubility of a drug. Here's the big cone. This is it. All right. So, we're going to spend the rest of this class talking about this. The blood gas solubility coefficient of the drug. So, what it means is this. And I want you to turn to page 66. Turn to page 66. Let me explain this. A partition coefficient is a ratio. What this means these are called, in physics, they're called Oswald partition coefficients. And what it means is that this gas in the body will partition. In other words, it'll separate itself in various parts of the body differently. Now, we already know that with IV drugs or solid drugs, you can have ionized and non-ionized. Well, these are gases, and they can behave similarly. And you can look at how a drug will partition itself in various compartments. All right, in this case, we're looking at the blood gas solubility. So here's what happens. All right, don't write. I'm giving an anesthetic. I'm one breath, two breaths. I got two, three percent FIVO on my dial. One breath, oh, they got a little fraction in there. Two breaths, a little fraction more. Three breaths, a little more. One minute later, two minutes later, the FIO, the FI is starting to go out. They're starting to uh, get a significant amount of the lungs. Let's say they got 1% of the lungs now. I look at my little screen. I can see the excretory, the, uh, excretory sevo is 1%. And so they're starting to get to my 2% dial. And the patient's starting to go to sleep. So the anesthetics in the lungs. Now, at the same time, of course, my heart's beating, hopefully. And it's pumping blood through the lungs. And the blood has no anesthetic in it the first time it goes through the lungs. The next heartbeat, when I got start to get anesthetic in the lungs, the blood goes through and picks up a little bit. And the next heartbeat picks up a little bit more, picks up a little bit more, etc., etc. You get the point, right? So over time, as the heartbeat keeps beating and I keep ventilating, he's going to start to get a lot of anesthetic into the blood. Now, some of that anesthetic that goes in the blood stays there and doesn't leave, won't leave. Reason is, the blood has, is not a liquid, it's actually colloidal. It has cholesterol in it, it has cell membranes full of lipids, there's platelets, there's red blood cells, there's white blood cells, there's, there's all kinds of stuff in the blood that has lipids, membranes, and so on. The anesthetics are lipid soluble, and they're going to go into the blood and stick in there and never leave. All right. At the same time, some of the anesthetic that's also in the blood, right along with it, when it goes off into the tissue, and the blood is delivered to the tissue, will leave the blood and go to the tissue. Let's just pretend, go on a tangent here. Let's say blood, it's got anesthetic in it, and it's going to my brain. Initially, there's anesthetic in the blood, there's nothing in the brain. So the driving pressure diffusion is from a high concentration to a low concentration, right? So blood will go from the blood to the brain. Blood to brain. But not all the drug will leave the blood and go into the brain. Some will just stay in the blood. The blood's sticky. It has fat in it. and has a tendency to want to soak up anesthetic, not let it go. So it partitions between the releasable form and the non-releasable form. They're both in the blood together, but some will release it off into the tissues, which is what you want, right? And others will stay in the blood. We uh, devised a coefficient for that. It's called a blood gas solubility coefficient. 
It's a partition coefficient, meaning it'll give you an idea or tell you how much of the anesthetic partitions in the what we call the gas phase, I hate that word. I wish they would have used releasable phase. But they didn't ask me. <laughs> and the blood phase. The blood phase is the non-releasable phase. So they gave us a ratio. Blood to gas. Blood gas solubility coefficient. How much in the blood is soluble? How much it stays as gas? In other words, it'll be releasable. It sounds like little gas bubbles. It's not. That's why I don't like that word. And the a coefficient is a ratio. All right. So let's take a look at page 66, middle column. Let's say sevoforine. The blood gas solubility coefficient is 0 0.6. Everybody see that? I'm reading right on this table right here. 0 0.6. That's the blood gas partition coefficient at 37 degrees centigrade. That's body temperature. So that's telling me at body temp, the average person, for every 0.6 molecules, these are ratios, so it's all, they're always over one. They just don't draw it that way. So really, the blood gas coefficient of SIVO is 0.6 over one. They just leave the over one out. You assume. So what that tells me is that for every 0.6 molecules of SIVO that stays in the blood phase, this is a blood gas, right? Blood gas. One molecule will release into the brain or off or any tissue. All right. These are partition coefficients. I'll say it again. What this is telling me is that for every 0.6 molecules of SIVO, that go in the blood and stick there to something in the blood, a platelet, a cholesterol molecule, a something, a red blood cell, somewhere in the blood. One molecule will release into the tissues. All right. Now, if I just round this up, I'm just going to do this. Let's say it's 0 0.5 to 1. That would tell me that for every 0.5 molecules of SIBO that sticks in the blood, one leaves. That's about twice as much, right? Twice as much is releasable into the brain as will stick into the tissues. All right, everybody with me so far? It's exciting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's look at isoforine. Blood gas solubility coefficient 1.4. That's really 1.4 over 1. What it's telling me is that for every 1.4 molecules of fluorine that I blast into somebody, then it's going to stick in the blood for every one molecule that releases into the tissues. So more is going to stick than the releases, right? 1.4 sticks, one releases. Which one do you think is faster? One with a higher number or the one with a lower number? Lower. Why? Because more is releasing to the tissues and making the patient get knocked out, right? SIBO is only retaining in the blood 0.6 molecules for every one it's releasing. Isoflurane is retaining 1.4 molecules for every one it's releasing. So it's going to take a lot more sporine to build up in the blood. It's going to take longer to reach equilibrium with isoflurane than it's going to do with sevoflurane because the blood gas solubility is higher. All right? So let's do some lingo. All right? When we say a drug solubility, we're referring to blood to gas solubility. All right? The more soluble, the higher the number. I'm just kind of laying it out there. Right? The more the less soluble, the lower the number. But just so you know how you read my chapter or hear people talk about it or whatever, this is the lingo, right? You can say it another way, half glass, half empty, glass, half full. How about this? The more insoluble, I am insoluble, the faster that it is more soluble. 
insoluble means less soluble, lower soluble. The lower the number, the faster the drop, basically. Yes? So using that line of, um, like, desplanation stuff not be faster than SIBO because it's, like, more too low than it says? Des is faster. Yes. You're correct. Did I say SIBO is the fastest? I thought you yeah, I thought that was what you were saying. No, I just yeah. used it because it was the flat box. No, so uh, desplane is the fastest anesthetic. But that's a good observation. Thank you. The lower the number, the faster the drop. Now, <clears throat> so bear with me here. I'm going to repeat. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying it over. Here. I thought I'm not familiar. All right. Just like the, the, the blood gas solubility coefficient of an anesthetic is that parameter that tells you how fast an anesthetic goes in and out of the body. That's it. I'll say it again. The blood gas solubility coefficient of an anesthetic. The speed of an anesthetic is indicated by its blood gas coefficient. The lower the number, the faster the drug. All right? Which fastest? What's fastest? Dead. All right. What's next? Nitrous. What's next? SIBO. All right. What's next? ISO. What's the least? Alpine. All right. That's it. That was easy. Now I'm coming in with this new drug 10 years from now when I, I'm a drug salesman and I make your way through the gauntlet of the pharmacy and the security. I ended up in the anesthesia department. I'm trying to sell you my new wonderful anesthetic. They say, well, how fast does it work? And they say, blood gas solubility coefficient is 1.5. What do you do? You go back to your case and laugh at the guy. This is going to be slower than anything you currently have, and nobody's going to want to touch it. We don't like slow. Or they say the blood gas solubility coefficient is 0.3. Well, then you'd stick around and eat some more donuts and pay attention. <laughs> Hear what the guy has to say. This is going to be fast. All right. If he tells you the blood gas solubility coefficient is 0.3, Six, uh, 0 0.5, then you'll know that, well, it's slower than DAS or, or nitrous, but it's faster than SIBO and ISO. All right. So let me summarize. I'll say it again. You're going to throw stuff at me. <laughs> Quit repeating. The blood gas solubility coefficient of an anesthetic is that parameter which indicates the speed of induction and emergence, how fast you're going to sleep, and of course when you turn the gas off, the same thing, comes on the way out, how fast you're going to wake up. The lower the number, the faster the drug. Or I say the other way around, the higher the number, the slower the drug. Whatever. Okay? Now, Let's go to the previous page. Question. Question. Shoot. So this does not have anything to do with lipid solubility? Uh, not directly, no. A little bit, but it's not the same as lipid solubility. This puts a factor, but no, it doesn't. Other question? No. All right, let's look at this figure. This is... This figure is looking at the FA out of page uh, 68, I'm sorry, 68. And we're looking at rate of rise in the LVI over time, first 30 minutes of a case, and we're looking at all the different anesthetics. What do you see? What's this going to be the slowest? Now, oh, because it has the highest blood gas coefficient, right? Which is going to be the next lowest? Fluorine. Next lowest. Seal. Oh, look at this. Des is 0.42, nitrous is 0.47. So if I wasn't lying to you, then it should be the other way around, right? Des should be up here, and nitrous should be here. But it's not. And there's a simple reason. You already know this. 
because nitrous we give 50% of, and des we give 7, 8, 9%. So the concentration effect, these are so close, 1.42 and 1.47, but because of the concentration effect, because we give so much more nitrous, nitrous ends up going in faster than des, even though des has a lower coefficient. If I lost anyone, let's read the lead. Bottom here. The rise in alveol concentration towards is inspired, FI over FI, is most rapid with the least soluble anesthetics. The least soluble means the lowest blood gas coefficient. All right? Nitrous oxide and DES in the slowest with the most soluble anesthetics now. The lower the blood gas solubility coefficient, the faster the rise of the anesthetic in the lungs. Note, nitrous oxide is faster than DES in spite of the fact that DES has a lower coefficient, or nitrous has a higher coefficient, due to the concentration effect. Nitrous is administered at 50 to 70 percent versus DES is less than 10 percent. All right. So, if I'm, I can draw this out. This is just blood gas coefficients. Nitrous, des, SIVO, isofluorine, whatever. If I get my this drug comes out on the market and the blood gas coefficient is 0.2, I want to add it in here. Ooh, it's going to be way up here somewhere, right? It'll be faster than the other ones. Our fastest one, des, is 0.42. If I had one at 0.2, it would be really fast. You know what I'm saying? Now, look at the figure in the table on top. Page 68, same page. Look at the table on top. So now you've got an anesthetic. It's going through the lungs, building up concentration. The blood is coming through, picking it up and carrying it away and it's going to start being dumped off into the tissue. And how fast that happens is determined by the blood gas coefficient. That's, that's the end of my story here. I just want everybody to be clear. And if you're not, I'm more than happy to say it again. But that's kind of where we're at right now, right? Okay, any questions about that? Good. Let's quit. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll pick it up right right here where we left off.